Let me remind you where I uh, was last time, which is talking about the opening passages in Capital, in Marx's Capital, which is not about capital, which is rather about the way capitalism appears how it, as it presents itself, which is this great wheel of circulation of commodities. And I talked about the uh, implication of that starting point, and I particularly talked about the fact that Marx says, instead of talking, jumping to what determines the prices of commodities, Marx steps back. It's a trouble with philosophers, you can't get them going easily, and so he, where Ricardo jumps to the question of relative prices, Marx steps back and says, well, what is this commodity? What is this thing? And he does it for a purpose because he wants to talk about the social relations inherent in the existence of a commodity. So he says in the first place, a commodity is a doublet. It's a use value in the sense that uh, Smith, Ricardo, and Marx talked about it, a useful object. And that aspect is related to concrete labor, the concrete aspect of labor that makes these objects. So we have, uh, here, commodity, and then it has use value, and the use value is related to concrete labor. Labor in its performance of the production, in its creation of uh, use values, is making things that are concretely different from each other. This is a use value. This is a use value. But the labor that makes chalk is a different type of labor that makes pens. And that is the concrete aspect of these labors. And that's important. It's not an, uh, just a philosophical term because it has to do with your abilities and skill and knowledge and training and all of that. But then a commodity is also an exchange value. And that has a precise meaning here. It's something that is valued for its exchangeability as opposed for its usefulness. A use value is something that's valued for its usefulness. An exchange value is something that's valued for its exchangeability. And those two need not be the same for two reasons. First of all, you can have a use value which is not exchangeable. In many societies, in most of human history, things that we did or produced or lived in or used as weapons were not exchange values. They were use values. They were built uh, collectively or individually, but they were not traded. So therefore, they were not traded in the sense of exchange, bought and sold. Uh, they were not exchange values. On the other hand, as Smith and Ricardo and Marx points out, for something to be a use value, for if it, I'm sorry, something to be an exchange value, it must have at least a potential use value for the buyer, for the person who's going to take it from you. Now, that's an important point, potential, because it may not turn out to be what you thought. I mentioned the point before that many people have bought in the past the Brooklyn Bridge, which is, by the way, a use value, but when you give money for it, you're not going to get what you think you're going to get, which is the Brooklyn Bridge, but rather you get nothing. So and there's many in the world of commodities uh, instances of things in which you exchange and you get something which doesn't turn out to be what you want or what you think you're getting. And this is important because there's already sets up a certain antagonism between exchange value and use value. Yes? Uh, that's a very good question, and I want to reserve that, but just to anticipate it a little bit, uh, yes, because it's possible to exchange money for money. 
and that becomes part of the circuit of capital. You don't exchange, you don't go to someone and say, look, here's four quarters, give me four quarters. That wouldn't make any sense. He would exchange four quarters for a dollar, but then there's a certain usefulness for that dollar because you need it for something, or more typically in New York City, you need the four quarters for the parking meters, right? So there's a use value aspect to that. But when you're making money out of money, which is a circuit MCM in its pure form, M, M, M prime in its pure form, then there's no use value attached. And Marx wants to introduce money into the story to show how it, it mediates these relations so it can become separated and become a sphere in itself. And he has some wonderful lyrical passages about that. I'll try to remind me of that when I come there. Okay. So the important thing is that exchange value is related, involves an abstraction. Ah. Sorry, a social process of abstraction from the use values. Now, what does that mean? It's a process in which you compare two things and make them equal in exchange precisely because they are different. Exchange has this thing that you exchange things which are different. And therefore, by making them equal, by saying, I'll give you so much of this for so much of that, those two quantities are made equivalent. But they are made equivalent through a social process, not through any natural property. And this is a very fundamental point in Marx, again and again comes up. It's a process of abstraction from their specific use values, and therefore, a social process, uh, uh, social abstraction <coughs> from the concrete qualities of the labor aspects of their labor, of the labor required to produce them. Now, it's Marx's contention that when commodities are regularly exchanged against each other, then you're not only abstracting from their specific differences by making them equivalent, you're abstracting from the differences of the labor that made them, and therefore, you are creating a new property to labor, which he calls abstract labor. So this is the foundation for abstract labor. I prefer to think of it as abstracted labor because this is a social property which is created through a social process. Not intentionally, but it's a consequence of the social abstraction. Everybody with me here? And so we went on to say that from here, Marx says, Marx argues that he's going to now define socially necessary. He actually doesn't just define it, he explains why, but socially necessary abstract labor time as the magnitude of value. And by here, he means labor value, but I mean the term value in Marx has now suddenly been inverted. Because in Smith and Ricardo, we know that value meant exchangeable value. And though they believed that labor had uh, something to do with the use value side, and maybe even with the exchangeable value side, he actually defines the term value to be a quantity of labor time. Now, there are different ways you can read that. You can speak of it as the intrinsic value or the labor value to distinguish it from the exchangeable value. Uh, and as long as you keep track of the meaning, it's okay. Yeah. Um, okay, one fundamental difference is that utility is a purely subjective and personal local property. It has literally no social magnitude because it's defined only for individuals and even the individuals are defined as relating to each other 
only through things, which Marx specifically uh, targets as a fetishism of commodities. So it's a subjective. He's arguing here that this process of abstraction is a process of creation of a social property, which he calls abstract labor. And that's really uh, a, a different location for the abstraction process, so to speak. Uh, in a utility function, you're converting all commodities into abstract quantities of your utility, but it's your psychological utility. A utility theory originally had this defect or possibility, depending on how you look at it, is to say that if utility could be thought of as some social property, then if you have diminishing marginal utility, then people who have a lot of money don't really care if you take some of this money away from them and you give it to poor people. Now, neoclassical theory was set up to avoid that conclusion. It was specifically set up in opposition to socialist ideas and anti-capitalist ideas. So it was anathema for these people to end up with the conclusion that objectively, if there was objective utility, or what's called a cardinal utility, so it could be compared, then I could say, well, hell, take a few million bucks from Bill Gates. Who's, he's not even going to notice and give it to me or someone else poorer than Bill Gates, right? But that implies social redistribution. It implies that the market is not the ideal outcome. It implies all kinds of things, role of the state. And so naturally, there was a huge allergic reaction in neoclassical theory to this. And they moved to the insistence that utility doesn't actually exist as such. It's just a mathematical convenient specification. What they mean, as Samuelson will tell you, for instance, is that you don't get utility, you get rankings. Now, rankings can't be compared. Who am I to say that if Bill Gates likes yachts more than, than uh, rice and I like rice more than, well, I don't have any yachts, but anyway, some equivalent thing, I can somehow mix these things up and make a comparison. I can't do that. So the point is that uh, this particular utility theory was, in effect, ended up being the entire opposite of a social criterion. Now comes a problem. If that's the case, how can you make any statements about what's better or worse? And welfare theory spent years and years trying to figure out how to say something of the society as a whole. And it said, ended up with the following. This is essentially the core of welfare theory. You can read like three, four hundred pages. This is what you're going to get out of it. A. If I take, I have a situation in which this one person has less and someone else has more, I can say nothing about whether that situation is better than what they had originally because I'd be making comparison between the two of them. But if I can take an initial situation and give this one person more without taking and diminishing any others, that's a Pareto uh, uh, improved or Pareto uh, preferable situation. So. Why is that? Because with these kinds of comparisons, I can only say that everybody has the same or at least as much or more than before. With nobody having less, then that situation is better than the previous. Now, again, notice how this gets around the social problem. Is it really true that if Donald Trump is richer and no one is better off, no one is, is worse off, that the situation is better? Well, a lot of people would argue that's not true because there are implications to inequality and all of that. But this allows economists to say, well, that's not my problem. If you want to study that, become a sociologist. And you don't be in economics. But this is not true of economics per se, clearly. It's not true of the classical economists. It's not, certainly not true of Marx. It's specifically true of that construction which, was, uh, which began in the late 19th century and developed into the modern Neoclassic economics. By the way, when the people who are doing it originally developed it, they were largely thought to be talking absolute nonsense. It was much later that these ideas became standard. Okay? All right, at the end of that digression. Any other questions? The history of utility theory is an important history to read, by the way. It's a very interesting and, and potentially interesting uh, topic for papers and dissertations and so on. Okay. So we have now this definition of value. Now why is it socially necessary? Because he's going to be using this value as the idea of the under some conditions the 
value is the regulator of exchange. Only under some conditions. For instance, uh, it, when Marx is talking about value uh, and he's saying, well, if we're talking about a state of society in which occasion, uh, exchange is occasional, it's in volume one of capital, the exchange is occasional, then value is not necessarily the regulator of that exchange because occasional exchange, the cost of the product doesn't necessarily become decisive. You may meet, one tribe may meet another and have some kind of occasional exchange, but it doesn't follow that the cost is a central fact. Other things can be the ceremonial values, the religious values of the individual product or the import of them can import, become important. But as exchange becomes more general and becomes more on a part of the normal intercourse of different producers, then the quantity of labor time that it takes to produce them becomes more important because the cost of that production becomes more important. So when we're talking about Ricardo's commodities, remember he split them into two parts. Those whose exchange value is not affected by their costs because they are, cannot be freely reproduced or sufficiently reproduced. And those whose, and which he says the big, the great world of commodity production is commodities that can be reproduced. Well, then the cost of their reproduction becomes relevant. What's their cost of reproduction? The Marx is going to start as Smith and Ricardo do with the idea that it is decomposable into direct and indirect labor time. Okay, and now we're familiar with that because we've done it in Smith, we've done it in Ricardo, and it's showing up again in Marx. So from this point of view, um, I lost my place, sorry, hang on, so yeah. Um, Uh, you, we have to ask, uh, what, are the, what are the preconditions for this regulation of exchange value by direct and indirect labor time, abstract, socially necessary labor time? And his basic answer is that uh, they must have uh, certain... Uh, regular exchange in which the commodities now become produced for exchange, not just occasionally, but become produced for exchange, and the object of making them is to exchange them, in which case their cost becomes relevant. And that's historically very specific. There is no moment, the no Smithian moment in the past where there were free producers who uh, exchange products in a society based only on exchange. That idea of generalized exchange became relevant in socialist literature uh, in the 19th century as people began to think about how to move away from capitalism. And one way was to say, look, people will all produce products and exchange them, but nobody will own any more of the means of production than they need for their own use. They can't pile up uh, like uh, a big, any big capitalists and pile up huge amounts of ownership of things that they don't use in order to make money. If you have a plant and you have equipment that you want to use with the people working with you, that's one thing. But you can't own uh, uh, $100 billion worth of plant and equipment which, because you're not using them yourself. So that idea was to talk about exchange as a means of, of connecting up and having a division of labor, a la Smith, but not having capital. Uh, many people oppose that. Specifically, Marx was very hostile to these ideas of generalized exchange as a kind of socialist model. But anyway, they've, per they've uh, persisted in the literature and are very common. However, uh, the point is that they did not exist historically. So when we get to the Marx's, Marx's equivalent of the rude and early state, which we're going to get to shortly, he does not mean by this something which used to exist. It's an analytical step in order to introduce the other parts, just as, as Smith does it that way. Uh, so, in, in volume one of Capital, this discussion of, discussion of occasional barter, regular barter, regular exchange, and then the production of commodities. And so, when does the production of value become central? 
or the regulation of exchange by value becomes central when you have commodities in which the dominant purpose of production is exchange. The products of labor are now non-use values to their owners and potential use values to their users, to their buyers. What does that mean? It means you start making things that you yourself have no use for because you're making them in order for exchange. And in that exchange process, the person buying it, or the set of persons buying it, has a, an imagined use value, and their actual use value may not be the same as imagined use value. That's the inherent contradiction in exchange, but they find out after they get it. So in a some sense, you have an incentive to puff up the use value of what you're selling in order to get the most exchange value from it. And that's where the term buyer beware comes from, because what you get is not what you think you get, may not be what you think you get, right? Uh, the oldest thing, of course, is selling things which are completely worthless as being more than they are. And you go down to many parts of the city and you can buy very expensive watches or handbags, if that's your preference or whatever, that are actually, of course, nothing of the sort but you think you're getting a bargain and they know perfectly well that you're getting stiffed because their job is to cheat you and your job is you think to trick them and you're always going to lose because they're professionals and you're an amateur. But that's what exchange can be. Is that point clear? Anybody bought recent Gucci bags or anything recently? You all <laughs> know what I'm talking about? Or uh, a good watch? Now we come to the issue of when a kind of instance of when exchange becomes uh, regulated by value. In the starting case, which is a simple commodity production, Marx calls that same point that Smith calls the root and early state. Marx says, let's consider analytically a hypothetical situation in which every producer is producing for exchange. And every producer is producing for exchange, therefore they're producing commodities. And competition will equalize the income that they get from this exchange process. And if that's the case, then the competitive price, which is Smith and Ricardo's natural price, and in this case, uh, it, Marx is equivalent of that, will be a price proportional to direct and indirect labor time. Or to put it another way, the relative prices will be equal to relative labor values. This Marx calls simple commodity production. Now we went over this in the case of Ricardo. So you should be able to retrieve it somewhere from your memory banks. And if you do, you'll remember that we showed that if you have these simple instances of equalized income per hour, then the price which will give you that equalized income will be proportional to the direct and indirect labor time, the number of hours it took to make the product. That's sort of intuitively clear, but we went through examples, I believe, of that, okay? So what's the point of starting here? Here we have commodities. Here we have exchange, therefore. We have competition, which is not identical, which is, in this case, the equalization leads to an outcome, the equalization of incomes. Let me add that this equalization of income is neither meant to be a desirable property nor something that's intentional. Well, remember what we said here, in, uh, and this is in, in uh, uh, Smith, but it also in Ricardo. You have two producers, right? You're making corn in this room and steel in, in this side of the room and steel in that side, and you're selling a product for something, and you're getting $11 an hour, and they're getting $10 an hour for their product. So some of them are going to wander over to your side, increase the supply. Your price is going to fall from 11 to 10 and a half. On the other hand, the supply is going to be diminishing here. Price is going to rise from 9 to 9 and a half and somewhere around 10. Competition is going to produce that. It doesn't fall, it's going to stay there. The price that's falling may go well below 10. The price that's rising may go above. and That'll provoke the flow in the opposite direction. So it can fluctuate, but the center of gravity of that will be 10. That's the equalization process. But notice, this is not the intention of anybody. People moving from $9 an hour to $11 an hour occupations are doing so to get more money. 
They don't want to end up at 10. They would like 11 or 13 or 15. And the people uh, therefore enforce an outcome. And of course, the people who have 11 don't want these crazy people coming into their occupations because it's going to bring down their income. So that conflict is inherent in competition, but the result is not intentional. It's structural. It comes from the effect of competition, not the intention. Or we, now we give it a fancy name, we call it an emergent property. Because it emerges from the interactions, but nobody actually wants it. Okay? Same thing, obviously, for profit rate equalization. Same thing for price equalization. All these classical equalizations are not meant to be exact equality, but a process. And all of them are things that nobody wants, in some sense. Okay? So we already know that um, we now have, uh, in this rude and early state, we have, um, oops, I lost my place. Hang on a second. Which page, page, page? This happens sometimes. Here it is. Okay. Second point about value, which is important. In this simple route, in the simple commodity production, value is not only the regulator, but it is in fact uh, the immediate uh, determinant of relative prices. Because in this case, e.g., simple commodity production. relative prices equal relative I'm going to always use or often use word labor here to distinguish it from say Smith and Ricardo's definition of value which is exchange value so relative prices will equal relative labor values the price of corn relative to the price of steel in the competitive price, so we're speaking of relative, uh, sorry, relative competitive price, the price enforced by competition will equal relative labor values. I mean, the numerical examples I gave you the price of corn would be 200 and the price of steel would be 100 because the direct and indirect cost labor time of, of uh, corn was 20 hours and that of steel was 10 hours. So that ratio of 20 hours to 10 is 2, 200 to 100 is 2. Okay? So this is an instance in which the regulation is immediate or complete, direct regulation. Because Value can be, labor value is in effect synonymous with price, except for the difference in units. Proportional, price is proportional to labor value. Everybody with me here? I said this is not a, anything to do with the desired outcome. This is an outcome of competition, which might be entirely antithetical to the interests and intentions of the individual producers. Furthermore, th this relationship does not in Marx appear as something that is socially uh, uh, valuable in the sense that this is what you should have. It's not meant to be a, a standard, a social standard. And the term value here, labor value, is not an indicator of social worth. Marx makes this point that things can be values and be terrible things. They can be produced for use, uh, for exchange. They can be used values produced for exchange, and they can be nonetheless socially horrible. Obvious things, uh, weapons, instruments of torture, like whips, which are commonly used, uh, were commonly used, both on animals and humans. These are sold as commodities. They are values in the sense of Marx, produced by abstract labor. 
and their price is regulated in, in a simple case directly by it, but that doesn't mean that they are anything desirable or that to say something is a high value does not mean in this terminology that it's socially worthwhile. Remember we had the same issue of productive unproductive labor. Unproductive labor did not mean something that is less socially worthwhile and productive labor did not mean something that is more socially worthwhile. So uh, in that same sense value has that same, it has a content here but its content is not in terms of social valuation or social worth. Is this point clear? Any questions about this? Okay. Um, this is obvious, by the way, and a further aspect of it is that those things which are not treated by the market as elements of cost do not appear in the determination of value. Again, not because these things are worth less, but because the market doesn't have to pay for them. Classic example of this is household labor. Insofar as household labor, and this is certainly true uh, up to the present, but it's certainly been true historically that that sphere of the production process in the village where uh, women particularly did a huge amount of work, as long as it didn't have to be paid for, it did not show up in the direct and indirect, socially necessary, abstract labor time. So each one of these words has a significance here. In capitalism, it doesn't appear as a cost. It becomes a cost only if you end up paying for that. So if you hire someone to do that work, then their labor is being valorized. That's a term Marx uses, valorized. But valorized is not the same thing as saying it's being made uh, somehow hold to a higher social worth. Okay. Yes. Um, I want to ask you about the relation between value and exchange value and Marx in comparison to Smith. Okay, that's a good question. Good question. So let me let me remind you. In Smith, he is the one. Is Smith is the one who already sets up this notion that relative competitive prices were equal to direct and indirect labor times, right? So what Marx adds to this is not that because that's already in Smith and Ricardo. It's the identification of the type of labor time that's going to enter. And that's valorized labor time. And he's going to call it, and that's why it's a good word, valorized labor time. He's going to call it value. Because that labor time which does not enter because it doesn't have to be paid for by the market gets excluded. And this is a, typically why we always talk about the thing the market leaves out. Neoclassical theory doesn't do that. You know, it just assumes there are no externalities. And, but in fact, the whole point of the history of the market is that it devalorized some things, unvalorized some things, and valorized other things. Okay, so where we left off was that the irony of simple commodity production or any generalized commodity production is that you can be only independent if you're not independent. You can only be independent if you are part of a collective set of independents that match. And that difficulty of matching gives the sphere of circulation, which now Marx comes back to. He says on the surface it's a glittering surface of smoothness and equality, but now he comes back to and says if you think about it, it's a sphere in which the contradiction inherent in commodity production is both exposed and resolved. That's his phrase, exposed and resolved. And what does that mean? Well, if you are producing too much steel and you're producing too little corn, the too much steel is going to be manifested as a drop in the price. The sphere of exchange is going to tell you it's too much. Too little corn, a rise in price. So the, on the sphere of exchange is a signal feedback mechanism that people who, who talk about markets emphasize, the feedback mechanism. But in so doing, when you decide to cut back on steel production, you're going to hire, uh, lay off some workers, you're going to have less raw materials, and so immediately you set into motion a series of consequences for others. Same thing when you get more corn, you're going to get more flour and hire more bakers and all of that, and that kind of relation, the feedback effect, is through the division of labor. So the division of labor 
takes place in an imaginary consistency, which of course it quickly realizes is not there, and the feedback is a change which causes more changes in the division of labor, so then you come back again with the different inconsistencies. It's not that you ever end up consistent, but rather you oscillate around some natural uh, prices or prices of production in Marx, some balance conditions, but they are never achieved as a state of rest, but rather of a perpetual series of moving centers of gravity. So now the sphere of, of circulation seen from afar is like this cloudy, beautiful, smooth thing. And you get close, you're standing on the edge of a volcano. It's bubbling and things blow up every once in a while and maybe take you with it. Uh, you see that circulation has a character for a reason because it expresses and resolves the contradictions of an individual production of a social entity. Okay, that's a very important point in Marx that he has now deconstructed the image of the commodity and the sphere of commodity production as this beautiful, smooth, harmonious surface and shown that it cannot be because it has a function which is a balancing function and that requires it to, uh, to be always moving and changing. In orthodox economics you get around this problem. I mentioned this last time. Well how do you get around this problem of the individual producers being integrated or as Marx puts it being articulated into a social division of labor? How does that happen? Pardon? I, I can't hear you from up here. No, the assumption of maximizing behavior in itself will not give you that answer. Just that that's the individual, right? There's something stronger. How, do you, how does orthodox theory uh, deal with the discrepancy between individual intentions and the social requirements to match? Well, the short answer is it deals with the same way it deals with everything, by assuming that it exists. That's called general equilibrium. We know in general equilibrium there's no process that can be done and there's a fiction of the wall region auctioneer. What you do is you say, if I have a bunch of offer curves for supplies and demands and under what condition can I, is there a set of conditions that I can construct, make up, uh, in which these will match? And that's called general equilibrium. And you're generally required to study a lot of math to to do that without realizing what the question is. And this question is a simple and old question, which was evident, by the way, uh, in the classical tradition and even in the, in the neoclassical tradition in the beginning. But now it's been forgotten. Okay? Yeah, okay, fine. So now we are coming to this key point. We are in the schemes of reproduction, I'm sorry, in the, in the simple commodity production, and we have prices proportional to value, which means that money and value can be taken as interchangeable, money quantities and, and value. I'm going to come back to the theory of money in a minute. But price and money uh, and value are very similar, and obviously, except for a scalar difference in units, whatever is in value will be in price. Right? So if a commodity takes 200 hours of uh, labor time to make, then it might sell for $1,000 because the unit of comparison is $5 an hour. Another one that takes 40 hours will sell for $200. So that proportionality, and these are only under competitive prices, not market prices, but the, the uh, competitive prices, uh, natural prices in the sense of Smith and Ricardo, that this one-to-one -one, uh, correspondence takes place. And Marx begins there just for the same reason Smith and Ricardo begin there, because it makes clear certain intrinsic properties that he believes will continue to be relevant as you move on. Just like Newton begins with the law of gravity without uh, talking about fluids like air yet, because he wants to show you the essential properties, what he considers to be the essential properties. But there's another reason, and this is important because it's almost entirely mixed missed in the Marxist literature, another reason to start this way, which Marx was aware of, and in obviously Smith and Ricardo were not so directly aware of. And that is Marx's own recognition that profit is not just created from surplus value, but from trade independently of surplus value. 
Now, I can't elaborate on that very much here, but here is to give you an illustration, something a point Marx already knows, because if you take theories of surplus value, which is Marx's writings on other economists of his time, other writers of his time in political economy, the first chapter of theory of surplus value is about a man named Sir James Stewart. And the commentary in that first chapter is about James Stewart's theory that there are two sources of profit. Profit on production, which in Marx is going to become profit on surplus value, and profit on transfer, which has nothing to do per se with surplus value. Now what does that mean? Here's a simple example. You have in your house a nice flat screen TV. Well, you're a graduate student, you probably don't. But let's assume you're a faculty member and you have a nice big flat screen TV. And some entrepreneur comes and steals your TV. Now, let's say TV is worth $500. So in your accounts, in your household accounts, if you keep such things, you say, my wealth just went down by $500, right? That's pretty straightforward. And if that person were to keep the TV for themselves, that their wealth would just go up by 500. Everybody understands intuitively there's no profit created here. Your loss is his gain, and bang, the zero is zero, right? The difference that you add them up is zero. But suppose that this person took the TV and sold it to me, an unscrupulous TV dealer, for 200 bucks. So that minus 500 um, plus 200 for the thief, I got the TV, I sell it for 500, and I get 300. So again, minus, two plus, uh, minus 5 plus 2 plus 3 is 5. Everybody understands is a transfer. But the difference is that here the minus 500 is in the household wealth, here the gain of the 200 in the cash I give the thief is an increase in household wealth. But my gain is 300 as a businessman, it counts as profit. And it's because the accounting, it's, the sum still adds up to zero. But the balance of payments in this case is from the island of capital to the island of households. And they've lost a net 200, minus 5 plus 2, a net 300, I've gained 300, balance of payments is zero. Their loss is counted as a loss in household wealth. My gain is counted as a gain in profit. Now, Stewart makes this point, not quite that way, but he makes this point because it was well understood that before industrial capitalism developed, there was merchant capitalism. And what did merchant capitalism do? One of its central activities was taking things at one price in some place or stealing them, usually taking them by force, like gold and and wealth of all sorts and bringing them to the center and selling them for more money. The loss here was never counted because it was outside of the capitalist world, so it didn't even count. And the gain here was counted after a deduction of costs as profit. So profit was created from a transfer. Now notice, this is not profit created from the production of a surplus product. It's a profit from the expropriation of existing wealth. And uh, Stewart calls this profit on vibration, because it moves from one pole to another, right? Marx, of course, wants a more precise term, so he calls it profit on alienation. All of this is in the first like three pages of Theory of Surplus Value. And then he says, and this issue is very important and will have to be treated later. And then he drops dead and he never treats it. And this is why I spent so much time telling you about the importance of paying attention to Marx's plan and logic rather than what he did because he never gets around to it. It was going to be in volume three or after. And it's not there. This is relevant because if you assume only simple commodity production and price is proportional to values, then you have abstracted from the transfer of value because there's no price value deviation. And so Marx is not just doing what Smith and Ricardo did, which is start there. He's doing something more, which is to deliberately abstract from something that he knows that he wishes to treat later, but he doesn't want to treat it until he's developed the fundamental source of profit and the fundamental regulator of exchange. 
and then add on the more concrete factors. Yes? Uh, yes, but in a, in a, uh, yeah, the answer is yes, and here in the following way. It raises the possibility of a crisis, but it doesn't give you the mechanism. Marx argues specifically in this section that the very fact that we trade things means that there's a possibility of a crisis because if I sell, you get the money. But then I don't have the money and if I uh, uh, want to buy something more, someone else has to sell. I'm sorry, if I sell, I have the money and you have the commodity. But it doesn't follow that if I have the money, I'll buy. And if I don't buy, if enough of us don't buy, then immediately we have a problem because all those people who are anticipating selling cannot sell. So the, the, uh, the reversion to the holding of money, which in Marx is, the terminology is hoarding, it, the holding of money away from circulation can break the chain of this whole circulation sphere. And he does mention this to say this, the existence of money means that I can hold something in its abstract form. Money means that I can hold in, in money form anything that you have. I don't need to sell money, I can just use it to buy. But if you have steel and corn and so on, you can't do anything with it because you bought, you produce it precisely because you can't use it, because you want to sell it. And so you're stuck with it and I've got the money. And there come moments where there is a reversion to money in which case those who have the money are sitting like kings and those who have the goods are paupers because they can't, and literally they're ruined because they have a warehouse full of things that they can't do anything with in that moment. However, he goes on to say, but at this moment I cannot tell you the cause of the crisis because the cause is not located in the existence of money but in profitability. He doesn't say that, but we know that in the existence of profitability and it's going to take him his usual typical Marxian way to get there which is roughly 3,000 pages. So he's going to say, well, we'll deal with that later. And of course he doesn't finish that either. But we know the answer, that it's, the break comes not from the existence of money per se, though it could. Uh, but the regular breaks come because of the buildup of the contradictions from profitability. Okay? Any other questions? Okay, I have to speed up a bit because this is all about coming to the issue of money. Now, the, the thing about money, the key thing about money, is that money arrives naturally in the sense, not in a natural, physical natural sense, but uh, intrinsically from the generalization of exchange. And that's a point Marx makes in volume one of capital about the different forms of value. There's a lot else there which I unfortunately can't dwell on here. But think about the process that if you have generalized exchange, then each one of you is a producer. Each one of you is producing a different thing. Each one of you represents an industry producing a different thing, right? When you go to the market, you have to compare the exchange value of your thing with the exchange value of other things. So there are what, 35 people here. So each one of you is going to make 34 comparisons to yourself, right? To others. But each one of the others is going to make 34 comparisons to someone other than themselves. So you have a, a huge multitude of possible combinations of comparisons. And that, and particularly if what you want has to be gotten by going through an intermediate step, then you get even more complicated results. It's automatic in the sense that it comes up in every society, in every time of history, that you have exchange of any general sort, some commodities become the reference point. So rather than my saying, the exchange value of my good is so much corn, so much steel, so much wool, so much hides, so much water, so much this and that and that, keeping a whole list in my head and on my board, by the way, in my house, uh, in my shop, I simply say, it is so much salt. Why would I pick salt? Because it turns out that almost everyone I pick salt because it is a general reference. Because almost everyone needs salt. And so salt emerges from exchange, gets anointed by exchange, and emerges as a kind of general 
equivalent. That's Marx's term, the general equivalent. And then the comparison is very straightforward. Each one of us says, my commodity is worth so many ounces of salt. And that's straightforward. And salt in that process is money. Money is that special commodity which arises, or set of commodities, it doesn't have to be one. It can be salt and hides, it can be few. But usually among the few, they are not quite equal and there's one that stands above them. But sometimes there's two. It's like having two kings or two queens or one king and one uh, duke underneath. So there's a hierarchy possible here. Everybody see this? And this happens again and again. It doesn't just happen in history. It happens now again and again. When in, the, in the 1970s there was a crisis uh, which we call stagflation and there was high unemployment and all that. People in the Catskills were not able to sell their goods because they didn't have the buyers. Yet, all of them were standing around going, look, I've got wood, you've got uh, corn you're growing, and you've got water, and you've got this, and none of us can find buyers. Because we don't have, I can't sell, I can't buy your stuff, and you can't sell, you can't buy mine, and here are the goods sitting together. So they created money. They created, uh, I've forgotten what it's called, uh, I lost the word, but anyway, they created the dollar, a currency, which was backed by wood, by cordwood. And you could get the equivalent of that by taking your goods to some place and saying, I'll take this amount of money created locally, and the local money could then be used to buy other things. So the demand that was intrinsic in the division of labor was then made possible locally through this uh, money. It was called the Berkshire dollar or Catskill dollar or something like that. Um, and then they wanted to have that more general. And they went to bank and said, you know, will you accept it? And the bank said, check with the federal government and said, not unless you're willing to go to jail because you know, only we have the right to print money and you can't create money. But that money came out of the necessity. It was reinvented. And throughout history, money's been invented. So let me just tell you some of the things I'm going to be ready with the pictures in a second. Some of the things that have been used as money historically. Okay, so now I want to talk about the treatment of the theory in money of Marx, uh, a treatment of the theory of money in Marx. But before I do that, let me point out that the part that is discussed in Capital, the only damn book he finished, is just those properties of money that can come from exchange. So he does not treat there, though he's perfectly aware of them, credit money. He doesn't treat there uh, uh, fiat money, money where the state prints and, and claims that it's not backed by anything. I'm going to come back. He does refer to it, but it's not mentioned in any great detail. Particularly, he doesn't treat money which is based on bank credit, because that was going to go in volume three, and we all know about volume three. So that's been the problem, typical of this unfinishedness of his work. So I need now to, I want to lay out a kind of schematic comparison between the theory of money in Marx at this level and the quantity theory of money, which we are familiar with. Uh, both in the classical tradition and, of course, in the Friedmanite tradition, and of the Keynesian theory of money. So hopefully, if I can do this, I'll be able to cover all of those in a fairly simple way. Let me start with an identity. And that identity is sales equals sales. Now, it doesn't sound like a very exciting identity, but actually you can write sales in two ways. One is you can say it's price times quantity. P is the unit price and Q is the quantity. So the sales is a money value of all the things you've sold, right? But you can also write this as the amount of money times the number of times that money must change hands to effect those sales, to bring them about. Now that's something 
uh, write this down so I can just make sure that we understand this. If I had time, I would simulate this by asking you to take pieces of paper and other people would have things and you would trade back and forth. And we would keep time, we would keep a record of each transaction and we would keep a record of each time the money changed hands. Now, obviously if I sold, if I had an exchange of a thousand dollars worth of goods in this room in half an hour, then that would be the result of the price of the average price of the commodities times the quantity. If it's only one commodity, it's easy, it's price and quantity, but if it's more, you're talking about index numbers. That's straightforward. But notice that for every such exchange, there must be amount of money changing hands, and there's no need that all of this is done with a single transaction. I, there can be a sum of money here, she can buy a product there, that money then goes to buy another product there, so it's the same money going around, but now it's making two turns, and it go around the room and it may end up making five turns. And someone else may start with an amount of money there, and trade over there, and it'll go around four times. And so when we end up, we can start with the initial amount of money, and we know the average number of turns because that has to be equal to the sale. So we can say that we started, this is $1,000, 10 times 100 quantity. So this is 1,000. And if I had here $50, uh, no, that's too little. If I had $200, then obviously the V must be 5 because that'll be the number of times, the average number of times that money must have circulated in order to buy $1,000. Everybody understand this? It's an identity and this is a starting point of all the sort of classical uh, and even the modern theories of money. It's called the Cambridge equation, the Friedman equation, the Ricardo equation, the Marx equation, and so on. Okay? Now, as an identity, that doesn't help me a whole lot, but if I assume that the velocity of circulation is de structurally determined, it doesn't mean it's constant. But let's just say that for this level of abstraction, the structure is given so that it's constant. What does that mean, concretely? It means that when I say structurally determined, it depends on the rules of the exchange. If I made a rule that everybody had to hand a number of dollars to someone else to get something, that is an exchange in which there's a one-to-one -one exchange between the number of dollars and the particular product bought. Now that same dollar can go, same set of dollars can be used for other things, so it'll circulate, but there's a one-to-one -one rule between the number of dollars and the number. But suppose I made a different rule. So in that rule, a certain amount of transactions will take place. You need an average velocity of five. But suppose I made a rule that's saying, look, you two are neighbors. I mean, you trust each other. So she gives you that, and you don't give her the money yet because you say, look, I have something I'm planning to sell, and when I get the money, I will pay you the difference between what you buy for me or my set of people who buy and your set of people, and we'll just trade the balance of payments. Now that means that the money doesn't have to be turned over so often because we're only using it to settle the net balance, not each transaction. So then the velocity of circulation goes up. That means a different institutional structure, if this is generalized, means faster circulation of the same money, which is another way of saying less money needed to realize the same commodities. That's all it means, less physical money. Is that point clear? In case you're ever on an island with money and things and you have spare time, you can, you can save on the money by uh, making a balance of payment system, but you have to keep track of things much more. That's the other side of it. So now, the quantity theory of money says that the causation goes from the quantity of money relative to commodities and the velocity of circulation. The causation goes this way. Here and here, uh, and from this it comes here. And the quantity theory of money has two versions, the classical version 
and then you might call it the modern or neoclassical. The neoclassical textbook version. Is this part familiar? People have encountered it somewhere, hopefully. So what's a classical version? The classical version is that if money increases faster than commodities increase, then price must increase if velocity is constant, right? So the classical version is if money increases relative to commodities, then the price level will increase. Now this is a version really in Ricardo, because Ricardo doesn't say that the quantity of commodities is constant. Quantity of commodities is determined by profitability. So it might be, it's growing at a rate determined by profitability. And if the money supply increases faster than that rate, then prices will rise. That's Ricardo's quantity theory of money. It does not imply full employment. It does not imply fixed quantity. The Friedmanite version and the modern version is different because it says that the output is equal to full employment output. And the reason it's full employment output is because the market system automatically provides full employment. If, if there's unemployment, wages will fall in real terms and then workers will become more attractive to capitalists, profits will rise, they'll hire more labor and uh, the employment will rise. Vice versa, if wages are too high, you'll have unemployment and that'll drive wages back down and the only balance point is full employment. That's standard in neoclassical theory. And if that's the case, then you have P is M uh, Q bar F E V bar. So you can see that M becomes the sole determined. And that's Friedman's idea that money is everywhere, uh, inflation is everywhere, a result of an excess supply of money. Right? Now you can argue that Ricardo would also say that, but it's a relative excess supply. So you can't say that increase of money supply will cause inflation. Only if it's more than the system can absorb. Okay? Four. Keynesian. Keynesians say that an increase in money can be lead, lead to an increase in demand. But an increase of demand can lead to an increase of output until output reaches full employment. So there's no necessary connection between an increase of money and inflation. Familiar? Hence, money supply leads to inflation only if output is already at full employment. In other words, increase of demand and increase of money, deficit spending by the state, any of that will not cause inflation unless you've already reached full employment. If you have endogenous money, money doesn't determine the price level, but it may determine the price level indirectly by affecting aggregate demand relative to aggregate supply. So the answer is to extend the theory of money in Marx, to take credit into account and fiat money into account, you have to develop the theory of aggregate macroeconomic demand and supply and its relation to price, which I can't do here. Uh, that's my volume three and you have to wait. Uh, but it's a major part of the, of the book also to show that you can make it concrete and you can actually explain the actual movements of prices and uh, quantity in modern economies. So as I say with Ricardo and Smith and we'll continue with Marx, these are not meant to be ideas that were valid at, uh, but have been superseded by better ideas. I honestly believe that most of the ideas today are worse ideas. 
So we should keep our eyes open and minds open for the possibility that they are elements. It's clearly not fully worked out in Marx. If it was, we don't know where it is because it isn't there. But the elements are clearly there. And so in order to fill this story, you need the theory of aggregate demand and supply, which much discussion marks about that, but not here in volume one of Capital. Okay? Okay, we're gonna move on next time. You have your midterm on Wednesday, and next time you will, um, we will talk about surplus value, going from value to surplus value and profit. Thank you.